70 hours. That's how long it took me to finish Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. But that's not the whole story. Believe it or not, this is the most prep work I have ever done for a modern game review. As over the course of February, I played all the way through Final Fantasy VII for the first time, and Final Fantasy VII Remake. So over the past six weeks, I have spent roughly 140 hours with Final Fantasy VII Story. I think most of you clicked on this video to see the changes to the story in the remake timeline, and so most of this video is focused on talking about that. Feel free to use the chapter feature to skip to that part of the video if you're not interested in hearing about the gameplay mechanics or the sandbox. The truth is, if you played Remake, aka Part 1, which is what I'm going to be calling it for the rest of this review, then you pretty much already know what to expect for Rebirth, aka part two. Expect one of your favorite stories from your childhood to be butchered by a bunch of senile Japanese men who regret putting anything edgy in their story. This on top of a mysterious ethics department that makes sure every single town in the world has a diverse population and there's plenty of LGBT pandering as well. Square Enix wasn't satisfied with a simple graphical remake with improved gameplay, no. No, they took a massive dump on the story, and this is something everyone realized in part one. And part two is just more of the same. Nearly every single story edition just makes the plot dumber. And it seems the audience has already spoken. They don't want to buy into this anymore. Rebirth is bombing. It's selling significantly worse than Final Fantasy 16, which sold significantly worse than Final Fantasy 15. But I also do want to say in this intro, before we move on to the gameplay section, no, I don't hate this game. I don't even necessarily think it's a bad game. I don't think it's a good game either. I think it's just mediocre. It's much like a lot of other games I've played on this channel, especially the sandbox. But it really doesn't need to be bad. Just the fact that it is a remake that is meant to be enjoyed by people who already played the original and not new players should already tell you that it's a bad remake. If this is your first experience with the story of Final Fantasy VII, I'm sorry, but it's been completely ruined. All of the subtlety is gone, every single plot twist is heavily foreshadowed, if not straight up given away long before it's revealed in the original. And some of the characters have been completely ruined as well, made completely bland. Before I ramble off more about all the various issues with this game, let's just get to the gameplay mechanics. So if you played part one, the combat in part two is incredibly similar, so I'm only going to cover the basics briefly, and then we'll move on to the changes. So the general flow of combat is that you use your basic attacks on square and each character's unique ability on triangle to build up the ATB gauge, which gives you the ability to cast spells, use items in battle, and each character's special high damaging abilities. Pretty much every enemy in the game has a weakness, whether it be elemental or a certain type of physical attack, which pressures them, and when they're pressured, their stagger gauge builds up and they no longer have super armor to basic attacks. When you build the stagger gauge all the way up, you get a damage phase where the enemy is stunned and they take 1.6 times damage. As defensive options, you also have access to a block and a dodge roll, which in Remake, the dodge roll was borderline useless because it didn't have any invincibility frames. Blocking was a much better option because of a materia called Steadfast Block, which allowed you to gain much more ATB by blocking attacks, and that is still in the sequel. However, they have also now added a perfect block, which blocks all the damage if you time it perfectly from any blockable move. And the dodge roll also now has a very small amount of invincibility frames, which is namely useful on characters like Tifa who can dodge pretty far and pretty fast. Every character in the game has unique combos and their ability on triangle significantly affects their playstyle. I'm not going to break them all down, but they usually fill into generic roles like Cloud is good at everything and he can counter most physical attacks. Tifa is a glass cannon, Barret is a tank, Aerith is a healer, you get the point. Your two allies in combat that you aren't currently controlling slowly build up ATB on their own, but it is very slow. Generally, they just block during combat, 
and so you are expected to constantly switch between the playable characters during combat, especially during boss fights, so you can set up as many ATB gauges as possible for when you get to the stagger phase so you can unload all of your strong abilities at the same time. On top of these mechanics, there's also limit breaks, just like the original game, which is an ultimate attack that gives you a cutscene that you're invincible during. And there's also summons, which unlike the original game, are not just a cutscene with a giant AoE attack that does a shit ton of damage, but you actually have the summon fight alongside you for a while and can use ATB gauges from any of the three characters to have the summon use an ability. When its meter runs out, then it uses its ultimate to hit all the enemies on screen. And that covers pretty much everything that is the same between Remake and Rebirth. So what about the new mechanics this time around? Well, now we have synergy skills and synergy abilities. I actually like these. This was a good idea. Basically, based on which party members are in your party and what abilities you've unlocked through the pseudo-sphere grid, you gain access to special combat moves that some are useful, some not so much, but the one I used the entire game was one that reflected projectiles as cloud. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that the one weakness of Punisher mode is that it can't block projectiles, and so, using this ability, you could reflect any projectile and also block any physical attack encounter. As for the synergy abilities, this is a new type of ultimate move that gives you a buff after you use it. It has one of three effects, either giving you unlimited MP for a short time, leveling up your limit break, or it can extend the amount of time that a boss is staggered and increase the damage it takes. All three of those are quite useful. I like the idea, no real complaints there. Another good improvement is that generally the combat just feels a lot smoother. There's actual air combos now. Now, not everyone has launchers and not everyone can even really jump in the air normally. But for Cloud specifically, the air combos feel great, and using a synergy skill, Tifa can be launched in the air to do some air combos as well. Just in general, hitting guys feels better, even if the enemy super armor ruins that quite a bit, if you ask me. Something else I want to briefly address, since it is directly tied into the combat, is what carries over from part one? Well, basically nothing. The game reads your save file, and if you have one from Remake, the intermission episode, or the demo, then you get one summon materia for each. Now if you watch my streams, you'll know the game couldn't read my save file from Remake for some reason, so I didn't get access to any of these. But it turns out it actually didn't matter at all. All of the new summons you acquire across the game are upgraded through these little shrines that you find throughout the six sandboxes. And so a leveled up summon is considerably stronger than the default summons. But I do find it highly annoying that you are sent all the way back to level 15 and given incredibly basic materia and there is no story explanation for this. Alright, now to talk about all the bad things about this combat system. There's quite a few, but I'll try to keep this brief. The biggest one, and the one that caused me the most annoyance playing this game, is the concept of the Death Spiral. I don't think I really need to explain this too thoroughly, but long story short, if one character dies, you're at a significant disadvantage, especially because using items takes up the ATB gauge, right? So instead of dealing damage to the boss, you have to use precious turns to revive your party members and heal them. The difference between this and any turn-based system is that you can only control one character at a time, so even if you do use a phoenix down and bring him back up, he could just die to the next attack from the boss. Even though the AI seems to be quite good at blocking, and they'll actually routinely get perfect blocks, the AI seems to shit the bed when it comes to unblockable attacks. There were many, many, many times playing this game where I would just revive one of my party members, the boss switches aggro to them, or they get caught in a giant AoE and die instantly, and I just wasted my fucking time. And if you think that's bad, when you've lost two party members, you gotta waste twice as much time. You might as well just die on purpose and reset the battle at that point. As for my second big issue, it ties back into what I told you earlier that nothing carries over from part one. This game is really stingy about giving you cool materia. In the OG game, and even in part one of these remakes, the game had no problem handing out 
magnify and elemental materia within the first 10 hours. In this game, you either have to do a whole bunch of optional shitty sandbox content to unlock them in the battle simulator, or you gotta play like well over 20 if not 30 hours. Obviously you're intended to do a lot of the sandbox content, so don't let anyone tell you that shit is really optional. But I think generally everyone would agree that more options to build your characters is better than less in basically every situation. There's no player choice in how you play the game, is the short version of that. And that extends even further a lot later on, as the game routinely splits the party and forces you to play as characters you don't want to. And I could talk about that here, but I think the gameplay section is getting too long already. So I'll talk about one more negative, and that is the sheer length of the boss fights. For some reason, every single boss in this game takes at least five minutes to kill. And no, min-maxing the amount of damage during the stagger phase doesn't make a difference because the boss has multiple phases and there's always a cutscene and it always cuts off your damage after a certain point to watch said cutscene. The only influence you have on how long these bosses take is how long it takes you to stagger the boss. And yes, if you already know what you're doing, you don't have to assess the boss and waste a bar at the beginning and you'll know all its moveset, so you'll be able to do that part faster. But the first time you're fighting a boss is going to take you at least five minutes. And I'm just going to briefly mention this right now. The final boss is an hour long. That is not an exaggeration. I have the fucking recording. The final boss sequence is an hour long. It's like 10 different forms or some shit. No, it's not fun. No, it's not epic or cool. This is only halfway through the goddamn story. It ruins the story. All right, I'm gonna briefly talk about RPG mechanics here, because again, if you played part one, you basically already know what to expect here. In fact, if you played the original game, it's not that far off. At least the materia system is very similar. Basically, there's four different types of materia. Green ones give you magic spells. Blue ones amplify whatever materia they're attached to, usually green ones. Purple ones can improve your stats or allow your party members to do special effects without you directly controlling them or just enhance your basic battle abilities like blocking. The yellow ones will give you new combat commands like stealing or assessing or using an enemy skill. Your materia slots are determined by your weapon and armor equipped. Materia is upgraded as you bring it into combat. You don't even have to use the ability in combat, just it gains AP when you defeat enemies. And obviously when materia levels up, the effect gets more powerful or you get a better version of a spell. And so all of that stuff is the same from part one to part two. What's new is they changed the progression system and they dumbed it down further and just made it worse in every way. So if you remember from Remake, you could upgrade weapons and this had its own tree and you could like min-max magic damage or physical attack damage or blocking or health or all these other stats. And these were represented as little spheres and as you upgraded your weapon level, you unlocked new stats to upgrade, right? Well, I guess that was a little bit too complicated for the lowest common denominator player because they have now dumbed it down to a really shitty sphere grid system like Final Fantasy X or apparently like Final Fantasy XIII's Crystarium or whatever it's called, where you now have like a traditional skill tree system. The problem with this system is that the stat upgrades are way less significant. We're talking a 3% upgrade to basic attack damage. Three fucking percent. That is goddamn useless. Yes, some of the upgrades are good, but a lot of them are not. A lot of them are abilities that sound good on paper, but are fucking useless. Like the elemental abilities that don't cost MP. Sounds great, but the ability does no fucking damage. Like, it's weaker than any of your other weapon abilities. So the skill tree system's dog shit. So what happened to weapon upgrading? Well, instead of being able to upgrade weapons, you now have two to three slots that you can choose from a list of upgrades that's predetermined. It's a much shorter list than the old system, but the upgrades are pretty similar. I think that part's okay, but I don't think there was anything wrong with the weapon upgrade system. This new system just seems way more dumbed down and the choices are less significant. 
And that's pretty much it to talk about for RPG stuff. Nothing else is worth talking about in detail, trust me. Let's get to the sandbox. You guys already know what I'm going to say about this. I hate giant sandboxes. I've never liked them. And the content here is not fucking good. It's terrible. It's actually really generic. This feels like a Western game, honestly, when it comes to the sandbox. Because it's a giant empty wasteland. It's got fucking Ubisoft towers. I'm not joking. Ubisoft towers. I thought we all agreed that this is bad, you know, except for Nintendo fanboys who pretend it's fine in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. But I think pretty much everyone else is sick of climbing towers to scan an area to unlock the locations of all the other pointless, time-wasting activities. But again, I don't want this section to be 15 minutes long, so I'm going to briefly cover all of the sandbox activities because they're the same ones in all six regions. There's very little difference. Hopefully that's good enough for you, dude. I don't want to talk about this shit again. I've already made like at least 10 videos talking about these exact same types of baby missions, chores, whatever you want to call them. They're the same ones in every sandbox game. So on top of the towers, you have scanning crystals. There's little places of interest that have two or three chests that you have to open, and that's it. There's summon temples, and this is where you go to strengthen your summon, or more likely to weaken the summon boss so that you can fight them and unlock them. There's reskinned enemies as mini bosses. There are little combat challenges where you have to do a couple specific objectives, but you really don't have to unless you're going for 100% completion. The reason you do these is to unlock special battles in the combat simulator so that you can unlock the good materia. And of course, there is a final boss of each region, which you get by scanning all the crystals in the area. And this unlocks an additional ability for the enemy skill materia. Then there's the Moogle missions. This feels straight out of Kingdom Hearts, one of many elements, just like a hundred acre woods minigame. You chase them around and it upgrades the Moogle shop. Just look at the fucking Moogles, dude. This is like the first movie designed for Sonic. They're hideous. Then, of course, we got the Chocobo Stealth Missions to unlock the Chocobo in each area. There's Excavations, which unlock new crafting recipes. Yes, crafting is a thing. I barely used it. Fuck crafting. I hate crafting. And then finally, of course, we have side quests. These are supposed to be the things that have actual effort put into them. But as you might expect, most of them are complete shit. You can expect such quests as Picking Flowers. Rescuing some kittens, leading a chicken back into its pen. Holy fuck, I hated that mission, because you have to like yank a box to lure the chicken over. But it's physics based, so sometimes when you yank the box, it won't move, and then you have to restart over again. And each chicken has a new ability that you have to like time how you pull it, or you don't pull it, or whatever. Holy shit, I hated the chicken mission. I don't want to talk about it. But most of them are just boring. It's just not really worth talking about in detail. The only reason you want to do these is if you want to build affinity with your party members. Yes, there's a pseudo persona system in this game. And your affinity, I believe, ties into your party level, which affects the amount of skill points you have. And honestly, I don't even remember what all it actually affects. The main reason I cared about affinity was specifically for the gold saucer date, which if you played the original game, I'm sure you remember that moment. Now, while this technically doesn't count as a side quest, I'm going to lump it in. The last sandbox activity is the Proto Relic Quest. This is basically a massive quest line spanning the entire game to unlock Gilgamesh as the ultimate summon. Now, although I ended up doing all of the quests in every region, when I finally got to the end of the game, there's a massive level spike in his little area where you have to complete these final combat trials defeating the other summons. The enemies were level 65. I was level 47 at the end of the game, and I was not about to grind just to finish this quest. So it was a very disappointing conclusion, but I will say, most of the Proto Relic quests in each region were actually pretty good. Each one has a unique mini storyline, and specifically the one in Cosmo Canyon gives you a bunch of new flashbacks with the old Avalanche gang, and as someone who became a Jesse enjoyer after part one, I quite appreciated those. This was one of the very few quests in this game I actually wanted to finish, but because of the huge level spike at the end, 
I just didn't have time, guys. I already put in 70 hours in this game. I wasn't about to grind to level 60 or whatever I would have needed to be to be able to beat this. Oh, and of course, there's mini games. A fuck ton of mini games. This might be the most variety of mini games I have ever seen in a video game. Definitely, at the very least, top three. But of course, the main mini game we're talking about is Queen's Blood, the card game. As someone who actually likes card games, I think Queen's Blood is pretty good. I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail again because I didn't really want this video to be more than an hour long. But the basic idea is that you have three lanes, your monster cards have a number associated with them, and you want your number in each lane to be higher than your opponent's numbers. You have to unlock spaces on the board by playing a card, and each individual type of card unlocks different spaces on the board. When you've unlocked a space more than once, it levels up the space, which allows you to place more powerful cards. And of course, much like any popular TCG, cards have special abilities that can vastly change the flow of the game. Me, I went with a fairly basic strategy for most of the game. I had two cards that could lower the power of other cards, and when you lower a card's power to zero, it destroys it. And for some of these cards that can destroy cards, they also unlock that space for your side. A big mechanic is that you can flip captured spaces to your side before your opponent has placed a card on it. And so believe it or not, at least in my experience, it's a lot better to go second in this game. You could say that's a flaw because you basically have to hold triangle to pass your turn at the start of every battle, but just given the way that these games go, going second allows you to cap your opponent's middle spaces before they can place something there, which gives you a much better chance of winning. But I'm sure there's all sorts of other strategies. There's probably decks you can build that are much better playing first turn. That was the strat I went with, and I had a pretty good time. I actually like mini games that have enough depth and complexity to be their own actual game, but most of the mini games in Rebirth are pretty simplistic and easy, or just not that fun. And unfortunately, there are multiple points in the story where you are forced to engage with the mini games. They are not optional. I really don't understand the logic behind this, but at least the mini games weren't complete shit. I can say that. And so, more or less, that is the sandbox experience in this game. I didn't really talk about chocobos or fast travel or any of that stuff. The fast travel is actually pretty generous, but the chocobos are kind of a mixed bag. I thought the water one had a really fun traversal ability, but the rest were just meh. Either way, I don't think those things significantly affected my enjoyment of the game. I will say, the sandbox definitely made this game worse. Finally, for the most important part of the video, let's talk about the story of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I'm going to assume you played the original game. If you didn't, there should be enough context here to at least understand what's going on. Also, I'm not going to cover what happened in Remake, because, again, you should have played it. This is a direct sequel. It takes place right after the events of Part 1. But the basic overview of the story of Part 2 is that once the gang escapes Midgar, they go on a massive globe-trotting adventure where they're just chasing down Sephiroth. That is the basic plot. Yes, a lot of individual plot events happen. You get the character backstories for Cloud, Tifa, Barrett, and Red 13, which is all important stuff, definitely. And there's a few twists and turns in there. But what there isn't is a classic three-act structure. And it was never meant to be. The original Final Fantasy VII was comprised of three discs. Rebirth ends a little over the halfway point of the story in the original game. Splitting one story into three was always doomed to fail, no matter how many new plot events they add. And this will become incredibly obvious once we get to the climax. Okay, so that's more than enough preamble. Let's just get into the story. So right in the first cutscene, we have a significant story change. We get our first view of the alternate timeline slash dream world in which Zack survived and all of the members of Avalanche died, except for Cloud, Aerith, and Biggs. Throughout the story, there's going to be snippets of this little mini tale that adds nothing of value to the story. In fact, it ruins a major dramatic element of the plot. 
I'm not even gonna talk about these segments any further until we get to the ending because you can already guess immediately that this is either an alternate timeline or universe or something akin to that, right? So the main plot actually begins with the Nibelheim flashback segment. The events here are mostly the same, but one notable change is how obvious the twist that Cloud's memories are fucked up is made apparent here. Cloud completely acts like a different character. He acts like Zack. As soon as you figure that out, well, I mean, you can probably guess what's going on here. One notable thing in the flashback is that Sephiroth is very gay. You're practically panting. I'm excited. <laughs> Such a puppy. All right, that's gay. And get ready for a lot more of that, okay? Every time Sephiroth shows up, there's gay vibes going down. And so after the flashback sequence is over, we get one of our main new plot points. Sephiroth is trying to see doubts in Cloud's mind about Tifa. Did she really survive being slashed by his sword? And Tifa knows that Cloud's memories are fake because she was there. Though because of her near-death experience at the hands of Sephiroth, her memories are also messed up, which explains some slight inconsistencies later on. The problem is, I hate this drama because I love Tifa. I'm a Tifa dude, she's easily best girl. She basically has almost all of the perfect traits of a woman. She's a tomboy, she's a childhood best friend, she has big titties, and a very motherly personality. It doesn't get much better than that. But of course, this whole game very much feeds into the love triangle because Aerith is the perfect waifu for Cloud according to the story and the developers and all that. They all have dog shit taste in women. Aerith is used goods. She's Zack's sloppy seconds. She even still has feelings for Zack and that comes up later. Another story change is that Calm gets attacked by Shinra because they're still on the lookout for Avalanche, which actually makes a lot of sense. I'll be honest, when I was playing the original game, I was wondering why Shinra just kind of gave up looking for these dangerous terrorists that killed thousands of people. So it kind of fixes a plot hole from the original game. The only thing I don't like is they just easily sneak out of the city. Now, nothing too egregious happens until you get to Junon. You'll notice you actually are able to defeat the Midgar Serpent instead of it being a monster far too powerful for you, which was kind of the whole point of getting a Chocobo in the original game. And the fight ends with the iconic moment where Sephiroth has impaled a giant snake onto a tree somehow. Well, he actually does that to the one you're fighting in true anime fashion. And Fort Condor is no longer a location, but now a in-universe VR strategy game. I'll be honest, I don't really care that much about this change. I kind of like the cute PS1 models. One major subplot of this game, though, to try and make sense of the adventurous globe-trotting nature of the original is instead of, like, naturally coming across new towns and plot events just by exploring, the heroes are now following the Sephiroth clones to get to Sephiroth, which, yeah, I don't really have much of a problem with that, I guess. It does remove a bit of that sense of adventure, but at least it makes sense why the heroes are going where they're going, right? Feel free to come to your own conclusions on that, but moving forward into Junon, once we arrive, we meet Rhonda, who is the mayor and sheriff, and they just straight up turned her into a girl boss. A major side plot of this game is that there is a massive bounty on our heroes for blowing up two reactors, which makes a lot of sense, and Aerith's bounty is actually ten times any of ours individually, because I guess Hojo just has that much power in the company. Hojo himself is a major issue with both the original plot and even more so for the remakes, but we'll talk about that a bit more later. And instead of saving Priscilla from the sea monster, we actually save Yuffie. In the original game, she was a completely optional party member, but obviously she's a pretty popular character and arguably iconic. So she was gonna be shoved in the main plot somehow. I suppose this works. We quickly learn that she was sent here to assassinate Rufus Shinra, the CEO of Shinra, after his dad was assassinated at the hands of Sephiroth in part one. And he's gonna show up at Junon for the huge parade that's about to happen. 
Now, Yuffie is a character I really don't like. I think she's incredibly obnoxious. I don't even care that she's 16 years old. I do care that she acts like she's 12. She has way too much fucking energy. She does all these, like, overly cutesy movements. She does a fucking Naruto run, like a Spurg. And she's a greedy bitch for Materia. Naturally, my stream chat loved her. Hey, Cloud. Want some ice cream to cool down? Or are you looking for something hot? Just admit it. Uh, ma'am? Obviously captivated by my bodacious beach body. Ma'am, I, I don't want to go to jail. Well, I'm, I'm answering yes. Obviously. Wait, you are? I, uh, didn't expect you to have an eye for beauty. Guys, I'm going to jail. <laughs> we also learned that Rhonda turned us in for our bounty, and this is the first of many plot points that doesn't make sense, because she actually gets paid just for telling Shinra our location? You're telling me she got paid like a million gil just to say we were sleeping in a hotel? The worst part of this is, we don't even get arrested at this point. Everyone's favorite Organization 13 reject, Roche, shows up here. He was a minor character in Remake who you fought two times. And he's here again to proclaim his homo lust for Cloud. You know, that sounds like a joke, but it's really not. So Roche announces he wants to have a showdown, a 1v1 with Cloud, and then he just fucking leaves! So anyway, we get access to Upper Junon the same way you do in the original game with the dolphin. And we get to our first of many retard moments. The gang walks around Shinra soldiers with a massive fucking bounty on their heads, with our pictures, and nobody recognizes them. Now, of course, immediately after this part, Cloud, Tifa, and Aerith do dress as Shinra troops, but I thought it was worth noting that they just walk around without a disguise before this, and they even bring it up a little bit later. In the remake, Cloud is made the commander of the parade troop, and you need to round up all the other units, and then set up the perfect parade formation so that you can win the contest, right? Because I guess all the divisions are competing in the parade for some reason. I don't know. I don't really care. I thought it was a fun moment. Yes, it ultimately just comes down to a rhythm quick time event thing. But I thought it was decently fun and quirky. Unfortunately, it is bookended by quite possibly the dumbest moment in the entire game. Or at the very least, top three. So during this part, it cuts away to Rufus, and yet another rejected Organization 13 member shows up, Glenn Lodbrock, an ex-soldier who Rufus himself killed. So he's obviously confused how the hell this dude in the black cloak showed up. And the whole point of this is to set up a subplot for part three, where Shinra and Wu Tai are going to war again. We don't really see the fruits of this in this game, so I'm not gonna shit on it. I think it's an okay addition to the plot, but it's hard to judge given that we haven't seen the war yet. But to get back to the parade, at the end, Rufus calls up Cloud, Tifa, and Aerith to be given special awards. And I think you can see where this is going. In another scene, they showed us that Avalanche was caught on camera, you know, at the part before we were wearing the disguises. Again, it makes sense, even if it just makes the party look really stupid. But Rufus is not here to arrest us. No, he actually wants to help us, as he claims he doesn't really care about the tasks his father left him when he died, and he would rather go after Sephiroth and rebuild Midgar. But then he says, quite possibly the dumbest line, in the entire game. That the good guys and the bad guys are basically both trying to do the same thing. What? What do you mean, lack the resources? You have jets, you have planes, helicopters. We're gonna walk on foot to look for Sephiroth. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I need to elaborate further on this. My reaction in the stream pretty much encompassed all of my thoughts. This just doesn't make sense on any level. Now, of course, we were never going to team up in the first place. Yuffie is about to throw her fucking giant ninja star and assassinate him, but Barrett sees her and yells, which makes her miss her throw. And then Rufus assumes we were trying to assassinate him, and then something else absolutely retarded happens. The hundreds of troops directly behind us leave to go find Yuffie, and then nobody arrests Cloud, Tifa, and Aerith. Oh, but it gets worse. The 7th Infantry, the dudes we were just doing the parade with, 
find Cloud, and they inform us they have no idea what the traitors dressing up as soldiers look like. But Rufus and Heidegger know what they look like. Why didn't they tell the troops who to arrest? And then it gets even worse because they commit treason and help Cloud shoot dozens of their fellow soldiers. This was fucking mind blowing how dumb it was. I mean, it's clear they stopped giving a flying fuck about making this even slightly realistic or make any sense at all and just wanted a cool sequence to happen. And then right after it, we get our showdown with Roche. It's actually a pretty fucking easy boss. And then we escape Junon on a cruise ship this time instead of it just being a normal ship. And on the cruise ship, we are given a Queen's Blood card tournament. I'm not going to get into it, but I did play all the way through it and I kind of enjoyed it. But just like in the original game, Sephiroth attacks the ship. But this is one of many moments you're going to notice how this is clearly rated T for teen. Instead of Sephiroth killing all of the sailors on board, they're just unconscious and you can hear them muttering. There's no blood. Nobody dies. It's fucking boring. We defeat another form of Genova and now we're at Costa del Sol. Now I know every single one of you has seen the part after this. Because for the first time since maybe Witcher 3, a segment of a game has been made for straight men. Unfortunately, you have to earn it by doing a bunch of mini games, but you get to dress Tifa and Aerith up in some genuine sexy swimsuits. And they're not shy about showing off Tifa's cleavage. I was fucking blown away that they showed this, man. I would have assumed Globo Homo would have erased every ounce of straightness out of high budget video games, but there's one fucking speck of gold in the mountain of shit. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it also plays out like a fucking beach filler episode of an anime where Hojo shows up and you have to team up with Johnny and Yuffie comes up with a genius plan to save the day and defeat Hojo. But that's not the worst part about this segment. The worst part is what Hojo says upon seeing Cloud. <laughs> so you heeded the call too, did you? What are you talking about? <laughs> He's spoiling the fucking plot. He's spoiling the plot. You can see your the time Janny's had to stop him from spoiling it and remake part one. They fucked up this story so hard. You can't tell me that doesn't fuck it up. I already know this could be a hundred excuses. Oh, well, the only people playing this are people who played the original. Yeah, why do you want to see a shittier version of the story you played as a child? Giving away the twist ruins the twist. This is not a complicated concept. Now, the next few parts of the story are mostly the same as the original, but I am going to give a few nitpicks here. The first one is a weapon shows up way, way before they're supposed to. And just look at how lame this thing looks compared to the kaiju that attacked Junon and later Midgar in Disc 2. Barrett's backstory is told basically exactly the same as the original. My only minor complaint is how stupid the scene looks where both his and Dine's arms get shot off. Evil titties! No! Oh, how very great. That's no recoil. Zero recoil! Zero recoil, zero accuracy. <laughs> and we head off to Gold Saucer. Now, the first visit here is essentially just a tutorial for all of the mini games, and you get a fake out date with whatever character you have the highest affinity with, but the real date doesn't happen until the second visit, just like the original. Kate Sith shoves himself into your party here, but to the remake's credit, it actually happens a lot more organically than the original, and so the party would have less reason to suspect that he's the spy. This is definitely an improvement because when I was playing Final Fantasy VII for the first time, it was incredibly obvious that Kate Sith was the spy. I guarantee you most children playing the game guessed it, which once again makes the party look like idiots. I'm going to say that at least once or twice more before this video is over. And instead of Dio imprisoning us by sending us down to the prison, he actually trusts us and gives us a little bracelet with like a mic on it and gives us 24 hours to prove that Barrett didn't kill these people. 
The prison sequence again is mostly the same, though Gus is now a very flamboyant over-the-top character. Not that it really matters, but there's a lot of those in this game. I mean, just take one look at Dio. Another nitpick I have is that the desert surrounding Corel Prison is no longer this endless wasteland that nobody could ever hope to escape. And it's stated that Corel Prison isn't even a prison either, it's more like a black market gang hideout type of seedy underbelly. But anyway, enough nitpicking. So we get to the famous scene where Barrett confronts Dine. Dine has completely given up on life and gone insane. To the point where he no longer even wants to see his daughter Marlene. And so Barrett has a showdown with his old friend. The boss fight is way too over the top for what it is, but that's not my real issue. My issue is right at the end, where instead of offing himself by dropping off of a cliff, a bunch of Shinra troops show up out of nowhere and they shoot him and kill him. And yes, I get it's supposed to be like a metaphor for Sui by cop, but that definitely does not have the same impact as him choosing to end it willingly. Again, it feels like censorship combined with over-dramatization, right? And that's many plot events in this game. There is no subtlety to the story anymore, which is probably yet another Nomura-ism. So anyway, after the gang escapes, with the help of Dio, he actually covers our exit, taking on Rude of the Turks 1v1. We then travel to Gon Gaga. This segment was actually optional in the original and was pretty short, but now it's, of course, much like other parts of this game, over two hours long. We meet Cisne, who is a former Turk, and apparently she was a character in Crisis Core. No, I didn't play it. But more importantly, we head off to the destroyed reactor, and once again, Shinra catches up to us. And keep in mind that Kate Sith has now revealed that he is a low-level Shinra employee. So, again, if the characters had a brain, they would probably figure out how they're being tracked everywhere. Oh, and yet another worthless detail, the party has been split into men and women, and so the men defeat some big mutant, but then Scarlet shows up in a big robot, and so the women have to come and save the day. But on the bright side, Yuffie gives one of my favorite lines here. Hey, it's that hag! <laughs> Anyone over 25 is a hag! And this is where it once again gets stupid. Cloud starts getting taken over by Sephiroth, and so he nearly kills Tifa, which sends her into the life stream, and she is swallowed up by the weapon. She has a very similar scene to the one in Disc 2 where she fixes Cloud's brain, so once again, they're showing off future plot points way before they're supposed to happen. The only difference is they're her memories instead of his memories, but they're very similar memories. Meanwhile, outside of her brain, we see the Time Jannies are still around, and even worse, now there are evil Time Jannies. Somehow Sephiroth has taken over a bunch of the Whispers, and they're evil, and they're fighting against the good Whispers. It's fucking stupid. Basically, the scene ends with the weapon coughing up Tifa, and none of the party questions Cloud nearly killing her. It doesn't come up again. At the very least, as a consolation prize for this series of terrible scenes, Cloud stays by Tifa's bedside until she recovers from the Mako poisoning and they nearly kiss, with Yuffie even cheering them on. Perhaps I judged Yuffie too harshly. Anyway, fast forwarding once again, now we get to the airstrip and we meet Sid. No, Rocket Town is not in this game. And also, no, this isn't fucking Sid. He acts nothing like him. First of all, he doesn't smoke. Second of all, he doesn't abuse women. Hashtag not my Sid. Sid was supposed to be a beaten down old man whose dreams were crushed because the space program was canceled. This Sid is much more upbeat and optimistic, and he doesn't mention any of that stuff, by the way. It's never brought up in the game. So maybe they're saving it for part three. I don't know. Another huge thing is Sid is not playable. His only role in this story is to fly us around on the tiny Bronco. And so, moving on once again, we get to Cosmo Canyon, and we get another modified plot point. Obviously, we learn the origin of Red 13 here. This is where he's from, right? But what they added on is that he's been faking his voice this whole time. Listen to his real voice. Oh, damn it. I to reset the recording. I'm back! Nanaki? I can't believe it. It really is you. 
<laughs> we were so worried. It's one thing to put on a fake voice. It's another thing to like sound like, you know, a fucking baby. Like they, they turn him into like, like like baby Simba or some shit. What the hell? Yeah. Hey guys, it's me. Yeah, get used to hearing that for the rest of the game, because he never puts on his cool voice again. Now, the events at Cosmo Canyon are mostly the same, but there are a few things to know. First, Bugenhagen doesn't believe that the party saw a weapon, and he doesn't think the planet is about to die. And he just straight up gaslights Tifa for no reason. I don't know what this adds to the story, but it pissed me off. But the more important change is that they have now explained where the black materia comes from. There is this ancient African tribe called the Gi, who separated themselves from the life stream and so now are like immortal ghosts and they want to finally die, right? And so the only way that they can truly go to the afterlife is by summoning Meteor and killing everyone. So they're obviously evil. I don't think this really adds anything to the story. I don't know why they felt the need to explain where the black materia came from, but all I know is I was annoyed because the story already is way too fucking slow. So now we finally arrive in Nibelheim again, though the circumstances of why we come here are different. Kate Sith is looking for a Shinra terminal so he can try and find out the location of the Setra Temple. But the terminal in Cosmo Canyon is gone, so he has the idea to go to Nibelheim to use the one there. Obviously, we saw in the flashback in the beginning of the game that Nibelheim was burnt to the ground. And so to cover up the tragedy that happened there and the experiments done on Sephiroth, Shinra rebuilt the town. And I believe in the original, they say all the people living there were basically hired actors to make it look like a normal city, but that is rewritten in the remake to just be townspeople who were emigrated there. This is all well and good. The issue is Tifa discovers immediately that the town is a sham. In the original, it was kind of up in the air until you went into Tifa's room and read the letter, and it added to this idea that Cloud's memories are fucked up, what really happened five years ago, you know? Well, so much for that plot point. The terminal that Kate Sith is looking for is located in the Shinra Manor basement, of course, and so to get access, we need a key card from someone working at the reactor. And once the gang arrives at the reactor, we see that the war between Shinra and Wu Tai has begun, as a bunch of Wu Tai soldiers attacked the reactor and were slaughtered. Now that we have the key card, we have to go into the Shinra Mansion basement. This is another part of the game they definitely fucked up. The mansion's only like one room, and the basement is now a giant underground lab. An hour-long dungeon where you're forced to play as Kate Sith. So at the end, we finally meet Vincent Valentine, and again, no, he is not playable. But I have to admit, the boss fight against him is pretty cool. Oh, and while we're here, they once again tease a way later plot twist specifically the creation of Sephiroth clones. So now we know where the temple is, but we also need a keystone to get inside. And of course, Dio has the keystone, so we have to head back to Gold Saucer. As we leave the mansion, Roche shows up once again, having now been turned into a Sephiroth clone. And we have our final showdown, and once again, it's way too easy. And once he's defeated, he then straight up just turns into one of these hooded Sephiroth clones. His mind is completely broken. And another plot point is brought up again, the cellular degradation of soldiers caused by the Mako infusion or the Genova cells. You get the point, it's a red herring because it's supposed to tie into Cloud's fucked up memories, but we know that's not exactly why his head is messed up. But then for seemingly no reason, we cut away to a TV screen in Midgar and we see Glenn Lodbrock give a fucking Bin Laden speech declaring war on Shinra. This story is so stupid, I don't know how anybody could take it seriously. And when we make our way back to Sid, Vincent joins us, but since he's not playable, he only does one or two minor things in the story from here to the end. It's kind of awkward, I'm not really sure why he's even here. Once we arrive back at Gold Saucer, we now finally get the date scene with the highest affinity character. Obviously, I rigged it, so Tifa would be my highest affinity, and I'll admit I wasn't disappointed. 
the loveless play that was in the original game has now been turned into some kind of VR experience. And again, it just comes down to quick time events, but the scenes are entertaining to watch. It's very romantic. And afterward, you and your chosen character ride the Ferris wheel and there's a nice scene. And if you max out affinity, you do get a kiss at the end. Yay, hooray. Fuck me, I wasted so much time for that. I'll take it though. The white race is saved. <laughs> there you go. And it's very sad because I know this is not fucking canonical. I haven't seen Advent Children in an eternity, but apparently Cloud is so obsessed with Aerith as his one-itis that he just hard friend zones Tifa and never gets together with her, which is just so fucking stupid and terrible. It, I, it makes- it pisses me off to no fucking end. But at the very least, there was a bit of fan service in this remake, and I'm hoping that extends into the famous scene under the high wind near the end of the game. Anyway, moving on, there's a huge tournament to get the Keystone. In the original, it was just the normal Battle Square mini game. But now it's turned into this huge show where Don Corneo is trying to take over the Gold Saucer. And so you fight a bunch of his minions, and then you fight him again. Of course he gets away, because he doesn't die until the Wu Tai side quest in the original story. But then, the Turks show up. They steal the Keystone, you know, Kate Sith betrays us, obviously. Everyone pretends to be shocked. And we get, like, the third or fourth boss battle against the Turks at this point in the game. And then immediately after this, we get another boss battle. This is the third boss in a row, by the way. That is a 1v1 showdown between Cloud and Rufus. And to make matters worse, it is the most annoying boss battle in the game. If you remember the fight near the end of part one, it's just like that, except he has even more unblockable moves and can counter even more of your attacks. He doesn't do enough damage to kill you, so it's pretty hard to actually lose, but it sure as hell will waste your time. But eventually you do defeat him, you track down Kate Sith, who is too stupid to leave the Gold Saucer in the easily 10 plus minutes that you're fighting the Turks and Rufus. And of course he hands over the Keystone to the bad guys, and the party has to shame him for betraying us. I can't believe we ever trusted him. Something exciting almost happens, Barrett almost shoots him, but Tifa stops him, and we just kind of leave him. Oh, and if you were wondering about the plot point where Shinra kidnaps Marlene and holds her hostage to keep Kate Sith as a spy in the party, yeah, that plot point's completely gone. Why? Because, again, these senile Japanese men can't have the heroes do anything bad, ever. No, Kate Sith, he just made one little mistake. He's a goody two-shoes Shinra executive who didn't do nothing. The only thing that surprises me here is that they didn't reveal that he is Reeve. Either way, now is finally the point of no return. We get to the end of the game, we go to the ancient temple, and the dungeon here is four fucking hours long. I couldn't believe it, it was such a slog. But near the end, this is where the new story finally starts to fall apart. Something that is incredibly obvious to the player, but not the party, is that Cloud gets taken over by Sephiroth. Cloud kills multiple Shinra soldiers, which I don't think Barrett would really give a shit about, but he still noticed that this is out of character for Cloud, and he nearly kills the Turks after you defeat them near the end of the dungeon. There's this 40 minute long walking simulator sequence at the end of the dungeon that is just a recap of each of the individual party members' trauma, except for Cloud, mysteriously. And as they come out, Aerith gives this big rousing speech, and Cloud just does not care. It should be obvious to everyone that there's something wrong with him. We need to stop doing what we're doing and figure this out. But they continue to do nothing. The only reason this story works is because everyone is an idiot. That is a bad story. But then not too long after this, some ancient magic holograms of the Cetra basically explain the plot that Genova is an alien and is their ancient enemy since thousands of years ago. And as a reminder, Sephiroth can hear all of this, and as far as we know, he still thinks he's an ancient. So that's a whole other level of stupid I'm not gonna touch. 
So anyway, the party retrieves the black materia, Kate shows up to save the day and holds the temple together. Everyone escapes except him, and he's just a toy, so a new body just comes along. And this is where the original plot is completely ruined and it derails into this shitty remake story. Instead of one of the most iconic moments from the game, where Cloud hands over the Black Materia, which comes out of nowhere because before that point, Sephiroth had never taken over his body, so it was a shock. No, instead, what happens is Barret tosses the Black Materia behind him, and it rolls into Sephiroth's foot. He picks it up and basically says it's not the real Black Materia, that it's hidden in some other world. And then he unleashes the power of the evil Time Jannies, while Rufus and Hojo are just chilling in a helicopter, and Hojo's just straight up like cheering on the end of the world. He's a fucking stupid character, just generic evil scientist with no motivations. There is no reason why he does what he does. He's just a crazy evil guy who's also a genius. Whatever, I'm derailing again. So Sephiroth calls Cloud over to him to be his gay lover in eternity. And then he hands the black materia back to Cloud as a power move. And you just got to watch the rest of this scene. I'm not going to narrate it. This is literally just a gay sex thing for him. He's like, no, I'm the Dom. You're going to give me the materia. Thank you, Tifa, please. Tifa, you need to, to bang the homo lust out of him. That's the only way. I didn't make up the rules. God damn! No! Die, Aerith, die. I'm coming for you. You ready to die, bitch? I'm hitting square. Gee, Aerith. Give me my black material. This is fucking stupid. <laughs> Why would they do it like this? No, you dumb bitch. At least throw it into the void. Daddy, Sheffy Watch, I got it. I'm a good little puppy, aren't I? Yes, Cloud. You're a good boy. Who's a good boy? I'm a good boy. <laughs> oh no, the power of uh, side hoe. Aerith mid for real for real. Drop her. Well, how is like what <laughs> why? Why does everything have to be so over the top? Oh no, now we both fall. Oh no. This is uh Now we get to the worst part of the game by far. There was a clear purpose to all of those Zack segments throughout the game. Now, somehow, Aerith and Cloud wake up in the other universe timeline dream, whatever it is. Yeah, her dream where both of her men are alive. You fucking slut. And Aerith decides to waste time going on a date with Cloud. I fucking hate Aerith. Stop shoving her down my throat. She should be fucking dead. And at the end of this sequence, we get our ultra mega retcon where Sephiroth shows Cloud that the life stream is a nexus of worlds or timelines. Again, it's not completely explained, but the huge crack in the sky that was in this other universe basically means that it is a doomed universe. And so this Sephiroth's grand plan is to create the reunion, a uniting of every parallel timeline universe dream into one, which is going to kill everybody basically, and he wants to be the ruler of the multiverse. It's fucking stupid, I hate multiverses, but this video is too long, I'm not gonna rant about it. And so, after a bunch of other scenes, we end up at the ancient capital, and we get to the most famous scene of the original game, where Aerith dies. Oh 
Oh my god, L2, R2, L2, R2, L2, R2. <laughs> Video games. I wish Cloud actually did it this time. That'd be base. Uh, what if I just don't press L2 and R2? Hold on, I want to see if anything happens. Did that... I mean, I feel like the game... You might not even have to press L2 and R2. I'm, I'm wondering. And it's just there for no reason. No! He better not fucking stop him. Like, imagine if instead of playing the original Fave 7, you played these remakes. Holy hell, dude. This is just worse in every way. It's just worse in every single way. Oh, there's still blood. It just poked her a little. Oh, it did go through. Okay, good. Stab her a second time for good measure. Yes, they ruined one of the most iconic moments in video game history. But I'd be lying to you if I said I was mad when this happened. Because I'd already gone through the nearly 70 hours of the rest of this game. If you've been listening to all the various story changes, does this moment really surprise you? As I have said several times over the course of this video, there is zero subtlety in these remakes. Every single impactful emotional scene from the original has been made overly dramatic and full of spectacle. So of course we couldn't just have Sephiroth plunge his fucking sword through Aerith because I guess since everybody already knows about the twist, we have to make it more exciting. It's not supposed to be exciting, it's supposed to be sad. Like I said, I didn't grow up with Final Fantasy VII. I had the twist spoiled for me like 20 years ago. But still, when I played the game for the first time last month, I still felt something. Because Aerith is with you for over 20 hours, you're going to grow attached to her even if she's not your favorite girl in the group. It is legitimately sad. I felt nothing when this happened in the remake, except annoyance. Not even anger, but annoyance. The only question I have left is, what is the point of these remakes? Are they actually going to change the timeline or not? And if not, why did you ruin the fucking story? There is not a single person on this planet that thinks this scene is better than the original scene. Alright, let's just move on. And now we get to the final boss, which is no joke, an hour long. Like, it's so overindulgent, it's insane. I'm no stranger to JRPGs and multi-form final bosses, but this is just not fun. But to talk about what actually happens during the battle, obviously you fight the Genova just like the original, but then Sephiroth shows up and you fight him it, like five or six fucking times. Zack joins you from the other universe to fight, and this is the only time you get to play as him, and he actually has his own special moves, which is kind of cool. Sephiroth turns into his bizarro form from the end of the original game. Again, showing up only halfway through the story, which kind of ruins it a little bit. And you swap between the different parties of characters, which you don't get to choose. So I really hope they're all equipped with good materia. Oh, and to add insult to injury, Aerith comes back, I guess from another universe or something, to help fight the final form of Sephiroth. This feels like the ultimate climax, the ultimate end of the game. And I thought the same when I played part one as well, because in part one you fight Time Janny God and then Sephiroth. But this is twice as bad just because it's an hour fucking long. And I feel like I have to talk about this even though most of you would never know. But I got to the very final form and died and accidentally restarted the fight because I didn't carefully read the options of the game over screen. I will accept most of the responsibility for this, but it's clear that retry from before current battle is a translation error. It should say retry from current battle. And so I picked the wrong option and I lost about an hour of my life. 
I wish I had more to say about it, but there really isn't much to say. It's just trying way too hard to be epic. Now let's just get to the true ending. So we defeat Sephiroth for now, but you know, he just leaves. Zack fades back into his universe. It seems like he's gonna be dead, but of course he's not. He's gonna show up in part three. And then we get the most controversial part of the ending. Cloud sees Aerith, but nobody else can see her. And so of course this leaves us with two options. Either one, Cloud's brain is completely broken, which I feel like would be way too easy. They're not gonna go with that. Or far more likely, in my opinion, that this is Aerith from the other timeline reaching out to Cloud and only he can see her because he went into another timeline. And yes, this is incredibly stupid and upsetting and ruins the original story beyond repair. I mean, there really is no coming back from this at this point. And look, there's gonna be several people, dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands that are gonna defend this change because they'll say the whole point of these remakes is to change the timeline. But if 95% of the story is the same, and the other 5% is purely to shit down the original fans' throats, is that a good story? No, it's fucking pointless. Nobody asked for this. Nobody. And they even changed the story one last time, because in the original game, right after the ancient capital, they go straight to the promised land. But no, instead, they leave the temple and head to some random field, and, you know, Cloud's going full schizo mode, seeing Aerith that no one else can see. There's a giant crack in the sky, implying that this is now a doomed timeline. And it's kind of left up in the air if Aerith actually finished casting Holy this time around, and Cloud has the clear useless Holy, which I know I didn't even mention in this synopsis. It's not important yet. I guess it'll be important in part three. And then Cloud has to leave this fake Aerith behind and they go fly in the tiny Bronco and then we cut to credits. This story fucking sucks, do I have to say it? So whatever, let's just get to the conclusion. Should you buy this game? Most likely no. If you're a super fan of Final Fantasy VII, then you've either already purchased it and probably finished it by the time this review goes up, or you absolutely despise these remakes for taking a giant dump all over the original story. Just judging by the sales numbers, I think the time jannies from part one really pissed people off, and so there was no way they were gonna buy into part two, at least not until this entire remake saga is out. And yeah, to reiterate, this is just the rest of disc one. That's pretty skippable. The only truly significant moment to the overall story in this game is Aerith dying, and that's all the way at the end. Even if you skip the vast majority of side content, this game is gonna be over 50 hours. And look, man, this is my third attempt at recording this conclusion because the first two were overwhelmingly negative. But the truth is I really don't hate this game. I did spend the vast majority of this video crapping all over it because it really doesn't need to exist. I could have easily made this video over two hours. I didn't even get my thoughts out on the original Final Fantasy VII and I had a lot to say. But this game just came out and it's already been forgotten, so there's really no point in putting in an extra three or four days to make a super long video that nobody really gives a shit about. I honestly don't think this video perfectly covers all of the true positives and negatives of this game, but I think most of you just wanted to hear about the story changes, so that's what I focused on. So to briefly overall cover the positives and negatives of Rebirth, the few positives are that the combat system is more engaging than the original game, which is really not much of an accomplishment. Final Fantasy VII has really bad combat for a turn-based JRPG. I wouldn't be surprised if that game in particular is one of the reasons why a lot of normie YouTubers say turn-based combat is dog shit. Turn-based RPGs can absolutely be engaging as long as they take brain power to play. But obviously Square went for the action RPG route, and by action RPG standards, it's just alright. It's certainly not one of the reasons you would want to play this game. Another positive is that the game just has a lot of great moments, even if they are just remakes of moments from the original. You can just tell by the footage in this video, I was smiling quite a few times, and not just because I was making edgy jokes. 
I genuinely like the main cast of Final Fantasy VII, and the dialogue writing for these characters is mostly good in this game. Now, I think Barrett was a bit toned down. Originally, there was a segment just talking about that in this video, but ultimately, he's still a great character, easily one of the greatest black characters in video games. Not that there's a long list of good ones. You'd think in the era of wokeness they would produce at least one, but no, Barrett is still one of the best to this day because at the end of the day, he's just a person who has black skin. He has flaws, he has a lot of admirable traits, and I'll be honest, I just really like the angry black man stereotype. He was based on Mr. T, and it shows. That's a pretty likable character archetype. And I could talk about Tifa all day. I love Tifa. Even though I shit on Aerith a lot, she's a pretty good female character, except when she's trying too hard to be cute. Cloud is kind of a mixed bag. His characterization has always been kind of inconsistent. And you could say that's a part of the story, knowing the twist about his memories. He's actively pretending to be something he's not when he's really more of kind of like a emo autist type. Especially if you watch Advent Children, where he leans hard on the emo depressed aspect. Holy hell, that movie sucks. I wish I hadn't watched it again while I was editing this. And even Yuffie has her moments, though I admit I still don't really like her. The rest of the cast is kind of forgettable, but I also thought that in the original game. So that's not really a criticism. Another great element is the visuals. I think aesthetically the game looks great and mostly captures the feel of the original, though just like I thought of part one of the remake, the sort of like gritty, rusty, rundown nature of the world is a lot less expressed here. They leaned more into sci-fi than retro futuristic. And one last good thing, the soundtrack is pretty solid, but a lot of the tracks lost their soul and general feel from the original, but some of them are good. Unfortunately, a lot of them are also copyrighted, otherwise I would have played them during this review. As for negatives, I mean, you saw the story section. There's plenty of issues with the story now. They added all these unnecessary plot points. The fact that we killed Time Janny God, and yet the Time Jannies are still around, and there's now evil Time Jannies. And now Sephiroth's entire plot revolves around multiple universes or timelines or dream worlds, depending on your interpretation. That was another section I cut out of this video talking about ties to Final Fantasy X and how the theory that these other worlds are just dreams, just like how in Final Fantasy X, Tidus was a recreation from a dream Xanarkand created by the Faith, and the Faith could easily be interpreted as just the life stream. As you can tell, there was a lot of cut content from this video, but it needed to go out. The point is, I don't think you should buy this. There's so much shitty stuff in it. The pacing is so bad. As I said, the sandbox experience is terrible. It's the same type of activities I've played in at least a dozen other games. Incredibly long, overdramatic cutscenes. Tiny segments of the original game being turned into multi-hour long dungeons. I'll never understand the logic behind that. Something like 15 to 20 unique mini-games. Though I hate to say it, the mini-games were one of the better aspects of the game. I didn't even get an opportunity to talk about the woke stuff. It was kind of subtle to the untrained eye, but to someone like me, it's obvious there's an insane amount of LGBT representation. Like I said, the diversity is everywhere. The random black NPCs in every single town across the world is incredibly noticeable. By the time I hit the 50 hour mark, I was basically only playing this for Tifa. Even though I know, in the end, she's gonna get cucked by a fucking force ghost. Truly blackpilled. That's about it, see you next time guys.